So welcome back once again. So today we are going to start a very important concept in multivariable calculus. Of course, you have already done that with single variable calculus. That is the maximum and uh, minimum values of a function. So, we will be considering a function, say, f of two variables, okay? So, now, like, uh, if I want to draw the graph of this function, if I want to draw the graph of this function, okay, so then it is going to represent a surface in the 3D space. It is going to represent a surface in the 3D space, right? It, is, it, is, it may be something like that, and then... Okay, so now just by looking at the graph of the function itself, you could have some idea about the I mean, maximum and minimum values of the function. For example, say in this very roughly drawn figure, yeah, you, you, you can see that, you can see that here, here it seems that at this point the function has a maximum and uh, at this point it seems that the function has a minimum. But it may be so, it may be so that, uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll have I mean, surfaces like this and then maybe, maybe something like this and so on, okay. So here, uh, for a function of two variables and for that matter, for a function of any variables, what we do, we are interested in, we are interested in the neighborhood of certain points, neighborhood of certain points, okay? So now, say, suppose I have a point, I have a point, A, B, okay, in the domain of definition of the function, in the domain of definition of the function, in such a way, in such a way that in the neighborhood of that point, say, suppose this is the point A, B, and I'm, I'm considering a small neighborhood, say, Suppose uh, a uh, disk uh, centered at uh, AB and of radius delta. Okay, so if in its neighborhood the value of this function is such that value of this function is such that all the other values of the function in that neighborhood, I mean, is less than equal to this function, then we say that then we say that the function f had a local maximum, f as a local maximum at the point A. B. Okay. So likewise, likewise, if you have, if you have, like this relation, this relation for all the neighboring points of A, B, then we say that the function f has a local minimum at the point A. So what I'm going to do, I'm just simply going to run through uh, uh, my slides, uh, some of my slides, so that it is uh, easier for you uh, to have a better understanding, better understanding. Okay, see here, here, in this figure, what I have, in this figure, what I have, I have, uh, the graph of a function of two variables, okay? And uh, as you know, that the graph is nothing but going to be a surface and it is going to look like some mountain, some trolls, some pits, some pits and so on. And here you can see that, you can see that at, at, at certain junctures, uh, for example here, for example here, I mean the, the value of the function at this point, it is like say, uh, what, at all neighboring points, the variable of the function, they are less than the variable of the function here. So likewise here, the variable of the function at all the neighboring points is greater than the variable of the function here at this point, okay? And likewise here also, here also, if we, call, if we consider the neighborhood, okay? So in fact, all these four, they are, all these four, they are points of local maximum or minimum. But here you can see that again it is showing it is, it is written something like absolute maximum, whereas I told you only about local maximum or local minimum, right? So what is absolute maximum and absolute minimum? Say, suppose 
if you consider the domain, I mean, in that domain, you consider all the local maximum and local minimums, and then what is going to happen? The largest of all the local, I mean, maximums, it is going to be called the absolute maximum. So, likewise, the smallest of all the local minimums is going to be called the absolute minimum. So, we will, uh, I mean, we will consider these, these, these concepts in more detail later on. But let me get back to the definition of maximum and minimum variables. So this is the formal definition. So a function of two variables has a local maximum at a point a, b, if f of x, y is less than equal to f of a, b when x, y is near to a, b. So uh, this is what I have already told you. You simply consider a, I mean this uh, with uh, center a, b and uh, radius delta. So it is easier for uh, you to visualize or understand that. So similarly, the number uh, again here, the value of the function at that particular point is going to be called the local maximum value. So similarly, likewise, if you have f of x y greater than equal to f of a b a, when x y is near to a b, then f is the local minimum at a b, and the value of the function at that point is called local minimum value. Okay, fine. So now. Let us go to a very important theorem. Let us go to a very important theorem. So, this is the theorem. So, what it says that if m is the local maximum or minimum at a point a, b, and the first order partial derivative of f at is there, then the partial derivative with respect to x and y of the function at that particular point it vanishes. Now, here one thing you have to remember. The this part, the first order partial derivatives of f and just here. This part is very important. Okay. It is not that, I mean, uh, like say the maximum or minimum value of a function and just the point, and I mean the partial derivative exists. It may not exist there. The thing is that if it exists there, then they vanish. Okay. Fine. So now, how to go about proving this? Okay, uh, I very quickly go about it. I hope you understood what I say about the existence of the function. Because, uh, for example, you 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 simply consider um, what is that? J equal to square root x square plus y square. That's going to represent what? Some sphere. No, no, no. The point. Cone. This is this is going to be a cone, right? Oh. This is going to be a cone. Okay. This is going to be a cone like this. Okay. So now, if you look at this point, if you look at this point, I mean, this is zero 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 here. Okay. So then you, you, you can see that, I mean, obviously, because there's a kink here, there's a kink here, I mean, you cannot, uh, what? The function is not smooth there, so that the partial derivatives, I mean, they, they don't exist there. But still, this is the point of what? Minimum here, isn't it? I mean, from the, from the figure, of course, I mean, you can guess something like that, okay? So that is why I insisted that, I mean, the partial derivative, if at all they exist, they are going to vanish at that point. So, uh, so let us come to the two form. So we are considering the value of the function uh, at the point A B. Okay. Now uh, suppose because I am interested in uh, the value of the function at the point A B. So what I am going to do? I am going to define. I am going to define say. A function say g of x to be equal to f of x p, f of x p. Okay, I'm I'm keeping I'm keeping p fixed. Okay, so basically what I'm considering, I'm if if uh, uh, j equal to f of x y, it represents the surface. Well, right. What we are doing, we are simply considering. The curve, which is nothing but the intersection of this surface and the plane, your y equal to p. Okay, fine. So now, now, 
like uh, if you consider its derivative, this derivative of this function. So then this is simply what limit x to zero. I mean z of your uh, x plus x minus uh, g of your what? Uh, g of okay, x is g of a plus x then uh, g of a divided by x, right? And then this is simply limit x tends to zero. If I compare with this, this is going to be what? This is going to be what? F of a plus x minus f of a b divided by h, right? And uh, what is this? This is simply your partial derivative of f with respect to x at that point. Is it okay? Fine. Now, yes. you know that for the existence of maxima or minima for this function, uh, at the point, at the point A is related to the existence of maxima or minima of the function of two variables at the point A, B. Isn't it? And you know that for the existence of maximum or minimum of this function as a single variable at the point A, I mean Z prime A must vary there, isn't it? Right? From single variable to double class. So that means F prime, uh, sorry, uh, partial derivative of uh, F at the point A B with respect to X, it must finish there. Okay? So, so that is why F of fx a b equal to zero. So likewise for the partial derivative with respect to y also, you can prove it pretty easily. Okay, fine. So now what what is the geometric significance of that? What is the geometric significance of this? So see being engineering students, because we were students of technical, I mean it's a technical university kind of thing, isn't it? IITs. So, uh, I mean, <clears throat> I'm going to emphasize more on the practical part or the physical interpretation or geometrical interpretation part. Okay. So now, let us let us assume that uh, the function f it has a maximum or minimum uh, at the point a. Okay. So now, now. Let us consider, let us consider the tangent plan. Let us consider the tangent plan <coughs> at the point A B. And let us assume that C equal to F of A B. Okay, so basically tangent plan at the point A B. What, what I mean by that, I am considering, I am considering, I am considering the surface J equal to F of X, Y. Okay. And I am considering a tangent plan to be, suppose this is the domain of this function, so this is a, b, 0, so this point is going to be a, b, c, of course, where c is the graph of a, b, and I am considering the tangent plan here. So then, you, you, you know that, what is the equation of the tangent plan? Your j minus c equal to fx at a, b, x minus a plus fy at a b y minus b. This we have already done, isn't it? Fine? Okay? So now, now, if the function f has a maximum or minimum at this point, at this point a b, that is at the point a b c, so then what must happen? This must be satisfied. This must be satisfied, right? So that means that means this is zero, this is zero. So eventually this is going to become zero. Is it okay? Fine. So yes. the, the tangent plan is nothing but j equal to c. Fine. The tangent plan is nothing but your j equal to c. Okay. So now if the Tangent plan is nothing but J equal to C. What does that mean? What does that it's mean? Parallel to the X Y plane. So that yes, it is parallel to X Y plane. 
Okay, so the tangent must be a horizontal line. Okay, fine. And it is obvious. Say, for example, the same figure I am taking here, and you know the points of maximum or minimum, they, they have been I mean, designated by 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you want to draw tangent lines at those points, you will see that they are always going to be horizontal lines. Okay, fine. So now let us come to the definition of critical points. So remember the points, the points where the partial derivatives of a function of two variables, they vanish, or if they do not exist, they can either vanish or they do not exist. So then we say that those are critical points. So this is the definition of critical points. A point AB is called a critical point or a stationary point also of the function of f if the partial derivatives vanishes there or if one of these partial derivatives I mean doesn't exist. I mean it is not necessary that both of them doesn't exist. If either of them doesn't exist also then also that particular point is a critical point. Okay, fine. And again, what we what we have learned from this theorem is, is that if f has a local maximum or minimum at a point a b, right, then a b is a critical point because it fits the definition of critical point. Okay. Now, whatever you see here inside that so I mean yellow shaded uh, uh, portion is very very important. However, as in single variable calculus, not all critical points give rise to maxima or minima. Okay, so at a critical point, a function would have a local maximum or a local minimum or neither. So uh, we will go to that uh, later on. But before that, let us uh, let us uh, try to do uh, a couple of exercises, and from there, I'm going to make more observations and. The existence of minima or maxima, it is going to be more clear to you. Okay, fine. So, so let us take the example. This was minus. Six y plus four. But let us take this at that. Okay. Of course, the input this thing is all you can take all uh, what mm, R2 to be its domain. Okay, fine. So now uh see what we can do. I can write this as uh, x minus 1 whole square plus y minus 3 whole square. So what remains? 9 plus 1, 10. I am left with 4, right? Am I okay? Am I okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, now, what does it represent? What does the, the, this one represent? Paraboloid, yes. It is something like this, right? It is something like this. So, um, okay, so this is x, this is y, this is j, say 1, 3, right? So this is 1, 1, 2, 3. So, this point. Okay, so at 1 and 3, your j is 4. So I have to go again 4 units up here. So it is it is going, going to be it is going to be something like this. It's going to be something like this. Okay, so this point is your 1, 3. This point is 1, 3, 4. 
right? This is a fair argument, obvious. Okay, fine. So now, like I say, you mean without doing anything, I, uh, I, I just want to have a uh, have an idea of I mean maxima or minima of uh, of this function. Okay. So now, uh, if you if you if you look at this, so obviously I can tell about the existence of what a minima, isn't it? Yes. I can yes I can tell about the existence of a minima here. Okay, fine. The existence of a minima here, but. If I if I if I if I consider if I consider uh, the domain of domain of uh, I mean f to be d uh, to be d whole R two right I cannot tell anything about the maxima isn't it right okay so yes. now. Are there any tests? Are there any tests that uh, that is going to give us some idea about the existence of maxima or minima of a function at a point? Okay, that is one thing. But obviously, since we know, since we know that uh, the minima exists uh, at the uh, at the point one comma three comma four, that is at x equal to one, y equal to two, like say. F one two, sorry, uh, this is three. Uh, F one three, sorry, not F one three. One three is a point of minimum. Okay, it could be either absolute minimum or uh, I mean local minimum. So now, if you if you check here, if you check here, uh, so F x, so F x is simply two x minus one, and F y is your two y minus three. Right. So obviously, obviously, what happened at at this at, at, at this point at this point, both of them vanishes. Right. So whatever theorem we uh, had earlier, that is pretty much validated. Okay. So now, now, instead of this, instead of this, let us consider this function. So it is uh, it is uh, something like hyperbolic paraboloid. Oh, I mean it is uh, extremely difficult to draw the figure. So I'm going to show you a complete resonated figure of this function. It is going to look something like I I, I cannot shape it up here. Oh, anyway, I I'm going to show it to you uh, uh, in a short while from now. Okay, fine. Here now, look at this. Look at this. So it is it is some kind of surface. It is some kind of surface. So obviously, if I want to find out the I mean, critical points, uh, if I want to find out the critical points at which uh, I mean there is likelihood of the existence of maxima or minima. So then for this, you can see that your f x equal to Two x and uh, f y equal to minus two uh, y. So obviously your zero zero is a critical point. Is it okay? Fine. Zero zero is a critical point. So yes. now what is happening? If I want to find out whether the function possesses a maxima or minima at these critical points, so I have to check what is happening here at, at, at the point zero zero, right? So now what is happening out here? Say suppose suppose I am trying to see what is happening around the point around the origin because if zero zero is a point of uh, I mean maximum then what we must have f zero zero f zero zero I must have this I mean inequality is satisfied right in the neighborhood of zero zero. Uh, for the existence of maximum, and similarly, sorry, existence of yeah, existence of maximum, and similarly for the existence of minimum, I must have this. I must have this, isn't it? Right now, what is happening here? Say, suppose you consider the value of the function along the line, along the line, your y equal to zero, or along x-axis, along x-axis. So then. What is going to happen? Then f 
this is going to be what? This is going to be x square. This is going to be x square. Uh, sorry, uh, this is going to be x square along x axis. Right? And similarly, f of x y, this is going to be minus y square along y axis. Is it okay? Yes. Fine. So now what is happening here? What is happening here? So that means if I if I consider a very small neighborhood, so suppose this is the magnified version of this neighborhood. This is x-axis, this is y-axis. Okay. So we have already seen, we have already seen that along this I have positive value and along this line I have negative values of the function. Is it okay? So that means that means the definition, the definition of maxima or minima fails there that, isn't it? I cannot have only this being valid at the point or only this being valid at the point, isn't it? Because if I consider the neighborhood, in the neighborhood I have both positive and negative values. So I, I cannot conclude, right? This is not satisfied at all. This is not satisfied at all and as well as this is not satisfied. Is it okay? Yes. Right? So that means that means the function has neither a maxima, it has neither a maxima nor a minima. Neither max nor minima. Okay. So uh, this kind of point has uh, I mean special uh, names. Okay. They are called saddle points, so we'll come to that uh, later on. But uh, for your car user, let me let me show you uh, the figure. Let me sh show you the figure. Okay, so here, here you can see. See, this was the previous function that we were considering. Okay, so it's of course a parabolic, and here. Here, this is the graph of the function y square minus x square. Okay, so then you can see what is happening out here at, at this particular point. And again, I'm going to give you a very practical, uh, I mean, scenario for this particular example. Hmm? I'm going to give you, I'm sure you give you a real life scenario here. Okay, and uh, so obviously, from, from this example, uh, you can see that uh, at a critical point, uh, a critical point is uh, not necessarily a point of maximum or minimum. Okay, fine. So now, here again, like uh, what is what is happening out here? Here, as this is similar to that, that very first example that we considered. So, here obviously the origin is a point of local uh, minimum. Okay, and here origin is a point of local. Maximum and you should not, uh, I mean, confuse with say here. Although this point was your know, 0, 0, 0, that was because the function is x squared plus y squared. Okay, fine. And here by origin, I mean origin in the xy plane. Okay, so here again at 0, 0, the function has a local maximum. And here, I cannot say anything about it. But you, you, you can see, and forget about these two. Uh, it will be very difficult if you want to sit at that particular point on that surface. Okay. But an interesting thing here is that, an interesting thing here is that for this particular surface, which has been constructed from the function y squared minus x squared, actually, it is, uh, I mean, the, the adjustment or the accommodation is such that you, you can probably sit here. You can probably sit here. Okay, fine. So, uh, I'll again come back to, I mean, you feel like sitting there. Okay. Now, let us see this scenario. What do you see here? Yes, I think Atul is present there. Yes? A man is climbing a hill. 
minus climbing the elevator. Okay. Okay. So now if you look at the terrain here, if you look at the terrain here, it is obvious that the man, it seems that, it seems that he is coming from that side where my cursor is. Okay. So if he is coming from that side, where is what is going to happen? Or or if he comes from this side, so then here somewhere that is going to be a point of local minimum, isn't it? Right? Yes. Is it okay? Fine. But you, you look at this portion. But if he approaches this point from both sides, either this side or from there, from, from bottom, from below, this point is going to be a point of local maximum. maximum. Isn't it? Right? So that is why this point is neither a local maximum or local minimum. And this is exactly what that particular function, your I mean, x squared minus y squared, it was giving you. Okay? So now you know that in real life, these points, which are neither local maxima or minima, which is called saddle points, they exist. Okay? Fine. So I'm, I'm going to show you some more interesting examples. So uh, this is what it is. This is what it is. So uh, a mountain pass also has the shape of a saddle, as you can see, as a photograph of the geological formation in last place. For people hiking in one direction, the saddle point is the lowest point on their route, while for those traveling in a different direction, the saddle point is the highest point. Okay? So now, in my next slide, what you are going to see, you are going to see this for the empty sets of maximum and minimum. So, it is going to be equivalent to whatever you have got, whatever you have got in your single variable calculus. It is nothing but the second derivative test. It is nothing but the second derivative test. And uh, it is exactly going to give you some way of identifying a point definitely as a point of local maximum or a point of local minimum. Okay. So uh, let us have a quick look at the test. So what do you have to do? So firstly, we assume that the second order partial derivative of f are continuous on the discrete center AB. So what you do, you take a very small neighborhood of AB. So I mean it is easier to visualize a I mean disk. So that is why they always talk about the disk. Don't worry about it. I mean, it is not necessarily a disk. I mean, it can be any small neighborhood of any shape or any extent. Okay. But because it is easier to visualize the disk, that's why we go for that. Okay. And suppose, and this, this statement is very, very important. No, no, I, you will see why it is important. Second order partial derivative of fr comes here. So that means fxx, fxy, or fyx, if we assume that Clarence theorem is satisfied there. And fyy at that point are continuous. And again, what it says that suppose the first order partial derivative of f with respect to x and y at that point vanishes, okay. And then they have defined this d. Uh, d, I mean, it is nothing but some kind of discriminant, okay. So d at a b is simply fxx, fyy minus fxy whole square, okay. So now what? What it says that if d is strictly greater than zero and fxx at a b is strictly greater than zero, then f of a b is a local minimum. If d is strictly greater than zero and fxx at a b is strictly less than zero, then it has a local minimum at that point. And this is very, very important. If d is strictly less than zero, then f is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. <coughs> okay. So uh, I I prove it. I prove it. But now uh, again I'm. So I have already told you about saddle point. In case C, the point A is called a saddle point of F, and the graph of F crosses its tangent at A B. Okay. I'll again come back to that. What do you mean by it crosses? Uh, so what is going to happen? I mean, once you extend that tangent plan, it is going to intersect that surface somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of that point. Okay. 
And again, NOV2 is very important. I mean, if D is equal to 0, this particular test, it uh, doesn't give you any further information. Okay. And uh, it, the function can have either local maximum, local minimum, or neither. Uh, neither. Okay. So, in that case, I mean, depending upon the nature of the function, you have to do an infrared test. And log 3 is about how, how can you memorize uh, this uh, formula for this d, 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 discriminant d. Uh, so, you can consider it to be the determinant given by this. Okay, so for you, it is easier to remember. Okay, so uh, I, was talking, I was talking about this saddle one. Mm -hmm. So now you may be thinking, you may be thinking, I mean, these are all, I mean, uh, very, very, uh, what? These are, I mean, imaginary concepts like uh, this saddle point, all this stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it is kind of partial concepts, okay? In my next two slides, I mean, uh, two figures, I, I want to disprove it, okay? So uh, look at this, uh, look at this. So this surface, has been generated through this function, okay? And obviously, you can see here, you can see here that here, your, this point, uh, I think it is zero, it is, it is a saddle point, right? It, it feels, uh, seems like, I mean, somebody can see it here, and they say that this particular function represents the monkey saddle, okay? The monkey saddle. I mean, maybe think it is just a joke, but in fact, it is not. You can see that it has provision for the monkey's tail also mm -hmm. to accommodate, it, right? So, this was about, I mean, saddle point. So, next, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do one example, and after that, I'll come back to the proof of that theorem, okay? Not, not theorem, the second derivative test, okay? So, let me just walk up an example, and after that, I'll come back to. I mean the second derivative test, okay, and I'm uh, going to show so that in fact it is true. Okay, so let us consider uh, this example. Uh, you have to find out the maximum and minimum values and seven points of the function. Your x to the power four plus y to the power four minus four x squared plus one. You have to. So, I'm going to be quick about it so that I can cover more. And again, uh, again, you do not necessarily have to write down the function on this f of x, so it can be any, you can use any other symbol. Okay, fine. So, firstly, what we are going to do, what we are going to do, we are going to find fx. So, this is going to be 4x cubed minus 4y, and uh, similarly, your fy is going to be 4y cubed minus 4x. And then f x x, it is going to be your yeah, x squared f y y. This is your f y squared f x y on y x. Uh, this is going to be simply minus four, right? Minus four. Okay, fine. So now. Firstly, what we have to do in order to find out uh, the critical points, we have to equate uh, fx and fy to be equal to zero, right? So, uh, what do we get if we equate fx and fy to be equal to zero? So, uh, fx equal to zero. This is going to imply y equal to x cube, right? So now f y equal to zero is going to imply your y uh, y q minus x equal to zero, and if you plug this value, x to the nine, right? So from here I'm going to get x into x to the power eight, right? Uh, minus one. So that I can 
write as fine eventually i can write it as this okay and i am not bothered about these two factors because they are going to give me i mean complex roots so from here i am going to get either x equal to 0 1 or minus 1 right so when x equal to 0 from here your y equal to 0 when x equal to 1 y equal to 1 and this so basically what we have to do we have to consider these three pairs mm. you cannot mix and match oh uh, you cannot mix and match just to Okay, fine. So now uh, let us check these points. So 0, 0, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Okay, fine. So now let us see what happens at those points. So uh, now, firstly, what we have to do? We have to consider the value of the Discriminant. Okay, where of the discriminant is given by fxx fyy minus fxy whole squared, and right. Okay, so obviously, obviously, what is happening out here? So you can see that your D00, it is minus 16, isn't it? Right? And it is strictly less than 0. Okay? So that is why 00 is a saddle point. Is it okay? Fine? Yes, yes. And then, and then <clears throat> at 1, 1, at 1, 1, obviously, I mean, D. 1 1 it is going to give you 1 1 44 minus 16 similarly d minus 1 minus 1 also the same value so minus 1 so we got 128 right yeah okay so obviously at those points i mean there is a possibility of existence of either maximum or minimum. Yeah. So now if you consider the point one one, then you can see that fxx, I mean f x x at one one, it is strictly greater than zero. Right? Similarly, I think yeah, uh, f x x minus one minus one also it is going to be strictly greater than zero. Right? So from the second derivative test, what is going to happen? So at 1, 1 and minus 1, minus 1, the function has a what? Minimum. Is it okay? So now I, I want to pose a question here. I want to pose a question here. See, in the theorem, I mean, uh, they, they have given the uh, conditions, they have given the conditions only in terms of fxx. Why, why are they silent about that point? Any guess? Let me just shade off the dust. Yeah, any, any guess? Why? Why? Why they are silent about? Uh, I mean, I'm quite right. No, no, no. You please, <laughs> you, you please look at this. I'm giving you a hint. Okay. See, <laughs> one thing. I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a hint. Okay. I'm going to give you a hint. See, I am talking about either maximum or minimum. I am giving this. Okay. And no, I did this comes first. Right? So this is minimum 
maximum huh? see d is always involved now i have given you enough hint see d is strictly greater than zero d, d is positive right okay so now that because this is positive this is positive this is positive what must happen this needs to be what both should have the same sign yes both should have the same sign isn't it so that is why that is why they are, they are silent about i mean fyy is it okay fine so now let us go to the proof of proof of the second derivative test so what we are going to do i am simply uh, going to prove that at a point a b at a point a b so if d a b is greater than 0 and f x x a b is greater than 0 then the function has a minimum okay local minimum yeah but before that if you recall in my last class i requested you to go to the chapter in steward group uh, which is called how derivatives affect the shape of a i mean uh, graph of a function okay so what i would like to do i would like to quickly i mean go through some slides which is going to tell you about what is there in that particular sector because we will be needing concepts from a function of one derivative. Okay, fine. So let us quickly go through that. Let us quickly go through that. Okay. So before I mean uh, before uh, this uh, proof of the test for existence of extrema. So what we are going to do, just it's analogy with function of one variable uh, we are going to discuss a little bit and it is about how derivatives affect the shape of a graph. Okay, so now what does f prime say about f? So now we are into single variable calculus. Okay, fine. So now here you can see I, I have a graph of a function and what I have done, I have drawn some tangents. Uh, at uh, different points uh, to the curve. Mm -hmm. So now you, you, you can see you can see that the f prime is nothing but the slope of the function. Sorry, slope of the tangent at those points, isn't it? So what is this? This is simple. You know that if f prime x is strictly greater than zero in an interval then the function is increasing in that interval and if it's strictly less than zero on an interval then f is decreasing on that interval okay so next thing next thing it is about maximum or minimum rate of function see when the function changes from increasing to decreasing the function has a maximum okay and when it changes when it changes from decreasing to increasing it has a minimum. Is it okay? Of course, we are talking about local, local maximum and local minimum. Okay. And in certain cases, in certain cases, what, what is what is happening out here? What is happening out here? Here, in these two cases, f is not changing its sign at a particular point. At a particular point. Okay. So for example, uh, no, not f, sorry, f prime. F prime. Okay. Not f prime. See. Uh, let me tell you. Uh, here f prime is strictly greater than zero. Here f prime is strictly less than zero. Okay. For this graph, this graph, it says nothing about that because it is it is a it is a horizontal line here. Okay. So I mean f prime is positive on both sides of C or negative on both sides. So we cannot get an interval containing the point C where you can definitely say that uh, I mean f is strictly increasing or decreasing. Okay, fine. So I mean those points are something like what? Points of inflection. 
No, no, points of inflection. Yes, fine. Fine. It will be different. Points of inflection will be different. Those points are going to be something like saddle points. Okay, fine. So we will now what we will do. We will think about what the second derivative say about the graph of the original function. Okay. So now here, I mean, it is intentionally the graph is drawn like this. Graph of the function in an interval a b. Okay. So now. Here, in fact, I should uh, definition I should uh, have given here right now. So here, in this particular case, if you look at the tangents, uh, if you look at the tangents, then you can see that the graph of the function always lies above the tangent. Okay. Whereas in this particular case, the graph of the function it always lies below the tangent. Okay. Fine. So in the first case, the uh, graph, the graph is called concave upwards. So what you can do, you can think about, you can think about the U, English uh, alphabet U. Whenever you think about English alphabet U, so that means you think about concave upwards. Okay? And whenever you think about an, an inverted English alphabet U, it is concave downwards. Okay? And uh, here, I think uh, another interesting thing you can notice here. If you look at the slopes, if you look at the slopes, you can see that the slopes are getting steeper and steeper, isn't it? So that means the numerical value of these slopes at those particular points, they are increasing, isn't it? See, this was kind of flat, this is a bit steeper, this is even a bit more steeper, isn't it? And here, from steep, they are becoming flatter and flatter, right? So, if you consider this slope as a function, this slope is a monotonically increasing function here, and the slope is a monotonically decreasing function here, right? So that means f double prime is going to be strictly positive here, and f double prime is going to be strictly negative here. Is it okay? Fine. So this is what you are going to see in the next slide. So the comments of the slope of the tensors, I have already told you what it is. So here, what they have done, they have taken, I mean, certain intervals, okay? So here, you can see, here you can see, like, this slope of tangents, they are positive. So, it is uh, positive or negative? Negative. See, it is like an inverted U, isn't it? In the interval AB, the graph of the function is like an inverted U, right? So, this is concave downwards. Here in, in the interval BC, it is concave upwards. CD, again concave downwards. Again, it is concave upwards. DC is also upwards. Ah, this is also concave upwards. And this is concave downwards. So, if F double prime uh, is strictly greater than zero in an interval, the graph of F is concave upwards on that interval. And if it is strictly less than zero for all values lying in an interval, then the graph of F is concave downward from there. Okay, fine. So the next slide is going to be very, very important because it talks about the second derivative uh, test for a fun uh, function of one variable or a single variable function. Okay, so it is about the existence of maxima and minima in terms of the second derivative test. So here it is. Here it is. So you must have seen I mean, an infinite number of times probably. Okay. So what does it tell? What does it tell? That uh, of course I'm talking about a critical point here, critical point here for a function of uh, single variable. So C is a critical point where the derivative vanishes. Okay. So what does the second derivative test say? That suppose f double prime is continuous near that point. That means in the neighborhood of that point. So then, if f prime uh, vanishes at that point and f double prime is strictly greater than zero, then f is a local minimum at c. And if the derivative function vanishes at that point and the second derivative is strictly less than zero, then f has a local maximum at that point. Okay. So, based on these facts, we we'll try to, uh, what do we try to? 
we try to prove this. Say what I'm going to do, I'm simply going to prove this A part. If D is strictly greater than zero and the uh, second order partial derivative with respect to x at that point is strictly greater than zero, then f is a local minimum at that point. So this is one. Okay. So Am I still here because sometimes the connection is lost? Yeah, I see you here. Yeah, but it is it it may go away. I'll have to reconnect them. Just a minute. Okay. Uh, see, uh, let me tell you what actually I am going to do because I am going to prove about the local existence of local minima. So you know that you know that it is. It is going to be something like this. It is going to be something like this. Okay. So what I am going to do here, I mean, uh, what I am going to do here, I say suppose this is the point. This is the point. This is the point. Say A B. Uh, this is the point A B, and here a local uh, minimum exists. So what I'm going to do in the neighborhood of these points, I suppose this is ABC or AB, F of AB. In the neighborhood of this point, uh, I'm going to consider a disk. I'm going to consider a disk. Okay. And then through AB, through AB, I'm going to consider a particular direction. Say in uh, direction. Uh, in the direction of the unit vector, say u k. Okay, so then what is going to happen? As before, if I draw a vertical uh, plan, vertical plan through this, okay, so that 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 plan is going to pass through the point a comma b comma f of a, right? So then that plan it is going to generate. It is going to generate. A curve like this is it okay for the time being? Fine. Yes, yes. So then, what we are going to do? We are going to prove that for this curve, for this curve, the function has a minimum at this point. Okay. So then, what we can do? This particular direction u k, right? It is an arbitrary direction. So at this point, we can consider any arbitrary direction, and for all the direction, we are going to arrive at the same conclusion. So that means in the neighborhood of this point EP, I'm always going to get a local minimum for that function of two variables. Right? So that is what we are doing. Okay, let us start. Uh, see, because and for that, what you have to do? Say, suppose you you simply consider, you simply consider, say this is z direction, and suppose this is u direction. Right? If you consider this is a function of one variable, so because this is an arbitrary direction, what you have to do, you have to consider the second order directional derivative along the direction u, isn't it? Because I would try to prove that the second order ordinary derivative, say for a function of one variable, what I would have taken, I would have taken the second order derivative to be strictly greater than zero, right? Since I am considering an arbitrary direction, as I have told you earlier, what is directional derivative? It is nothing but derivative along an arbitrary direction. And that direction is going to be given by that u can, right? So what we are going to do, we are going to, in fact, prove that, I mean, d to u f at a b, it is strictly greater than zero in the neighborhood of that point. This is what we are going to do. Okay, so now your uh, let us assume that. Let us assume that your u cap this is h k. U cap is h k. So then your d u, your f, say x y. 
So you know this. This is I can simply write it like this. Don't worry. It is simply this, right? Then d to u fx y. This is simply d u of Isn't it? And then this is du and this is fx is plus fy k, right? So now again apply, again apply. So uh, the uh, again apply the formula for directional derivative. So then it is going to be what fx is plus fy k first order derivative of this into x plus fx is plus fy k y then k is it okay fine yes, so yes. Even, eventually eventually what is going to happen eventually what is going to happen if you if you simplify this i mean after working it out you can easily see that this is going to give you your fx a square plus two. Okay, I can do that. This a square plus f y y k square. This you can easily do. Okay, I'm not going to spend time on that. So, so now I have to do some kind of manipulation here. I have to do some kind of manipulation here. So. This one I can write as a square. And see, remember what we assume that we assume that d uh, at a b is strictly greater than zero, and f x x at a b is strictly greater than zero. Hmm? So uh, now uh, what I am doing, I am considering, I am considering. This second order directional derivative at the point A B C. Suppose I consider the second order directional derivative at the point A B. So basically, what is going to happen? D you get squared f of A B. So simply this, this will be these derivatives are uh, partial derivatives are going to be evaluated at the point uh, A B. I still have the reflection. Yeah, I think now it is fine. So now, and this AB I am not writing here, but this one has been considered at the point A. Huh? It should be like that. So A square then plus two A's. Now I want to adjust this. Hmm? If I want to adjust this, so this will be FXY by FXXK plus FXY whole square f x x whole square k squared okay. come back to this figure later on and uh, then then see i have uh, from here from here f y y k squared so here i have negated uh, i have to negate this one if i negate this one this is going to give you minus fxy square now this will be simply fxx and this will be k square okay and uh, i have this uh, fyy k square is already there okay fine there is a fxx square fxx square in the denominator this one. Last no, 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 because this is fxx and this is fxx squared. Oh, so one. Okay, okay. Ah. one okay. So and since uh, fxx is strictly greater than zero, I mean this uh, portion is valid. Is what we are going to do 
Uh, we are going to please adjust this switch. K squared, K squared by FXX. So this is going to be XY squared. Okay. Fine, and, and everything has been considered at the point A B. So now, obviously, obviously, because f x x is strictly greater than zero, this is greater than zero, and this is nothing but this is nothing but D at the point A B. So this is already greater than zero, and this is again greater than zero, right? So obviously, obviously, this is going to be strictly greater than zero. Is it okay? Fine. So now, yes. what is happening? What is happening? I have already been given that f x s. It is a continuous function. Okay. And if you look at the formula for d, you know that it is the product of some continuous function. Product of some continuous function, isn't it? And then it is simply like a sum of two continuous functions. So. This fx and d, they both are continuous at the point A. Right? They are both continuous at the point A. So that means that means your d this one uh, must be continuous. This this one must be continuous in A B. Yeah. Isn't it? So yes. that means that means what is going to happen? What is going to happen? That means so I'll just erase this. I'll I'll tell you what is happening out here. That means say if I if I consider if I consider a small disk, say suppose. This was my whole domain D, and this is the point my this is the point A B, and this is the direction say U cap. So this is A B. So if I consider a small disk of radius delta, uh, radius delta. Okay, so in this region, in this region, in this region. I am always going to have the second order directional derivative greater than zero, isn't it? Yes. For all points, for all points x, y, line in this case, right? So that means what is going to happen? What is going to happen if I consider the cross section of the function f of x, y by by this vertical plan? This vertical plan. Through this direction you get, so then I am going to get a curve. I am going to get a curve like this. Okay, so then, like in this interval, in this interval, in this interval, in this interval, right? I am always going to have for this curve, it is going to be concave upwards, right? This term is always going to be concave upwards, isn't it? Because the directional derivative is positive. Positive, right? So now you consider any arbitrary direction through that point A B. For all of them, I am going to arrive at the same conclusion, right? So that is why. That is why. What I am going to get? What I am going to get? That the function. F has a minimum at the point A. Okay, so that will conclude the proof. So in our next class, what we are going to do, we are going to I mean learn about I mean absolute maximum and uh, absolute minimum. Okay, so till then I will see you in my next.